Thus far in Module 5, we have been studying the major organ of the integumentary system, namely the integument, or skin. We now turn our focus to other organs of the integumentary system, which are classified as accessory organs. Accessory organs of the skin include hair follicles and nails and certain glands. In Module 5.6, we will examine the anatomy and physiology of hair, describe the processes that produce hair, and explain the structural basis for hair texture and color. Let's begin now. Hair and several other structures, hair follicles, sebaceous and sweat glands, and nails, are considered accessory structures of the integument. These structures are produced from the epidermis during embryonic development. Hairs are non-living structures that are highly keratinized and produced in organs called hair follicles. Hairs are found in the integument on most surfaces of the body. We do not have hairs on the sides and soles of our feet, the palms of our hands, the sides of our fingers and toes, our lips, and portions of the external genital organs. Let's begin with the structure of hair and hair follicles. Hair is produced from the epidermis during embryonic development. And, for that reason, the walls of each hair follicle contain all the cell layers found in the epidermis. However, the hair follicle pushes down deep into the dermis, and even into the hypodermis in many cases. The epithelium at the base of a hair follicle forms a cap over a mound called the hair papilla, a peg of connective tissue containing capillary blood vessels and nerves. The blood vessels supply nutrients and gases, and chemicals that influence hair growth. They also remove waste products produced by the living cells there. The nerves found here may play a role in regulating the growth cycles of hair. These are not to be confused with the root hair plexus. The root hair plexus is a special group of nerve fiber endings that wrap around the hair follicle and serve as sensitive mechanoreceptors for touch sensation. These nerve fibers detect movement of the hair and relay such stimuli back to the central nervous system. Therefore, even the lightest touch of a mosquito landing on a hair can be perceived. Surrounding the hair papilla is the hair matrix. The hair matrix has epithelial stem cells that produce the hair itself within the hair follicle. As the stem cells divide, they produce progeny daughter cells, and as the daughter cells are pushed toward the surface, the hair lengthens. These living cells produce the protein keratin, and eventually undergo keratinization and die. Recall that keratinization is a process in which the cytoplasm of a cell is packed by keratin protein. The point at which keratinization occurs is about halfway to the skin's surface and marks the boundary between the hair root, the portion that anchors the hair into the skin, and the hair shaft, the part we see on the surface. Each hair shaft is made of three layers of dead cells packed with keratin. At the very core, we have the hair medulla. The medulla contains a flexible, softer keratin. Surrounding the medulla, we have the cortex. Surrounding the cortex, we have a superficial layer called the cuticle. The cuticle is made up of an overlapping, shingle-like layer of cells. The cortex and the cuticle contain thick layers of harder keratin, which give the hair its rigidity. These are the layers of the hair you see in the hair shaft. Outside of the hair, we have the hair follicle. The hair follicle contains multiple layers, some of which are found only in the deepest parts of the organ. Just outside the hair cuticle is the inner root sheath of the hair follicle. The inner root sheath is found along the hair in the deeper parts of the follicle. It actually contains several thin layers not shown here. The inner root sheath has its own cuticle, not to be confused with the hair's cuticle. Outside of that, there's a layer called the Huxley layer, and outside of that, a thin layer called the Henley layer. Again, these are not depicted here, but I mention them simply to make you aware of their presence. Outside of the inner root sheath is an outer root sheath, which can be found along the length of the hair beneath the skin. The outer root sheath is actually the deepest layers of the epidermis, the basal layers. That includes the stratum spinosum and the stratum basale. The outer portion of the outer root sheath is a thin glassy membrane that connects to the basement membrane. Outside of the glassy membrane is connective tissue. The hair follicle is surrounded by a connective tissue sheath that is produced from and connects the hair follicle to the dermis. 
Hair grows in cycles with various phases. The names of those phases are the antigen, catagen, and telogen phases. The typical growing phase of hair growth is called the antigen phase. Normally, about 90% of our hair follicles are in antigen phase. During antigen phase, cells in the root of the hair are dividing rapidly, adding to the hair shaft. During this phase, the hair grows about 0.3 millimeters per day, or approximately one centimeter per month. Scalp hair stays in this active phase of growth for two to seven years. This period is determined by an individual's genetics. At the end of the antigen phase, an unknown signal causes the follicle to go into a second phase of the growth cycle called the catagen phase. Catagen is the involuting or regressing phase. The catagen phase is a short transition stage that signals the end of the active growth of a hair. This phase lasts for about two to three weeks, while the hair converts to a club hair. A club hair is formed during the catagen phase when the part of the hair follicle in contact with the lower portion of the hair becomes attached to the hair shaft. This process cuts the hair off from its blood supply and from the cells that produce new hair. When a club hair is completely formed, the hair follicle enters the third and final stage of the hair growth cycle called the telogen phase. The telogen phase is a resting or quiescent phase. Normally, about 10% of our hair is in telogen phase and the telogen phase lasts about three months. In unique instances, such as under extreme stress, as much as 70% of hair can prematurely enter the telogen phase and begin to fall, causing a noticeable loss of hair. This condition is called telogen effluvium. The club hair is the final product of a hair follicle in the telogen stage and is a dead, fully keratinized hair. Some anatomists refer to the late stages of telogen, when the hair falls out, as an exogen stage. On average, 50 to 100 club hairs are shed daily from a normal scalp. The shedding of hair can be promoted by new growth of underlying hair pushing the older hair from beneath. The cycle thus repeats with a new antigen phase beginning. The timeline for hair growth cycles varies from region to region on the body and from individual to individual. The pattern and timing of hair growth is regulated in part by chemical signals such as epidermal growth factor. Not all hairs on the body follow the same timeline for their growth cycles. While hairs of the scalp may grow for two to seven years, those of your eyebrows, for instance, may grow for only four to seven months before falling out. The length of the various cycles given here are for hairs of the scalp. Other factors such as an individual's genetics, sex, and age also contribute to considerable variation within these growth cycles. Let's talk about hair texture. What determines hair texture? The answer to this question continues to be an area of ongoing research. Numerous genetic factors may be involved. That being said, there are two anatomical features that influence hair texture, namely the shape of the follicle and the angle of the follicle beneath the surface. People with straight hair have very round hair follicles and their follicles tunnel vertically down from the epidermis to the dermis below. The follicle of wavy hair tends to be more oval in shape than round. Also, the follicle lies at more of an angle causing the hair to bend or curve, leading to a wavier hair. If the follicle is flattened and found at a steeper angle of incidence beneath the surface, the hair will be much curlier. Other factors correlate with hair texture. For example, oils from sebaceous glands that are secreted onto the shaft of the hair travel more easily along straight hairs. The pathway is more difficult to travel on curlier hair, and therefore people with curly hair tend to have drier hair as well. What does hair do? The 2.5 million hairs on the human body have important functions. The roughly 500,000 hairs on the head protect the scalp from light impacts to the head. They also protect from UV light and provide insulation for the skull. The hairs guarding the entrances to the nostrils and external ear canals help keep foreign particles out. The eyelashes perform a similar function for the surface of the eye. A sensory nerve fiber is associated with the base of each hair follicle. As a result, you can even feel the movement of a single hair shaft. This sensitivity provides an early warning system that may help prevent injury. For example, you may be able to swat a mosquito before it reaches the surface of your skin. A bundle of smooth muscle cells forms the erector pili. It extends from the papillary dermis to the connective tissue sheath around each hair follicle. When stimulated, the erector pili pulls on the follicle, forcing the hair to stand up. Contraction may be caused by emotional states such as fear or rage, or a response to cold producing goosebumps. 
In a furry mammal, this action increases the thickness of its insulating coat. Humans do not receive any comparable insulating benefits, but the response persists. Hair color. As in skin, melanocytes produce melanin pigments that color our hair. Melanocytes are primarily found deep in the bulb of the hair follicle, lining the surface of the hair papilla. Different amounts and forms of eumelanin production produce darker hair colors across a broad spectrum from light brown to dark black. There are, roughly speaking, five different natural hair colors, black, brown, blonde, white and gray, and the rarest of all, red. Among these major colors, different shades also exist. The pigment pheomelanin colors hair orange and red. The types and amounts of pigments produced are genetically determined. Other genetic factors that influence hair color include single nucleotide mutations that lead to red and auburn hair colors. For example, a single nucleotide difference in the melanocortin-1 receptor gene found on chromosome 16 can lead to the red hair phenotype. Environmental factors, such as UV radiation, can also influence hair color. UV radiation can trigger the production of certain compounds that ultimately influence levels of eumelanin production, thus influencing hair color. What about gray hair and white hair? As pigment production decreases with age, hair color lightens. White hair results from both a lack of pigment and the presence of air bubbles within the hair shaft. As a proportion of white hairs increases, the individual's hair color is defined as gray. Because each hair is dead and inert, changes in color are gradual. Finally, on a clinical note, I would like to discuss hair loss. Some people feel anxious when they find hairs clinging to the hairbrush instead of to their heads. On the average, we lose about 50 to 100 hairs from the head each day, but several factors may affect this rate. Sustained losses of over 100 hairs per day generally indicate a net loss of hair. The absence or loss of hair is called alopecia. Temporary increases in hair loss can result from drugs including chemotherapeutic agents, radiation dietary factors, high fever stress, or hormonal factors related to pregnancy. In males, changes in the level of circulating hormones can affect the scalp, causing a shift in production from normal hair to fine peach fuzz hairs, beginning at the temples and the crown of the head. This alteration is called male pattern baldness. Some cases of male pattern baldness respond to drug therapies, such as topical application minoxidil, or Rogaine. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy for cancer treatment can cause hair loss because both cancer cells and normal cells, notably hair matrix stem cells, are sensitive to chemotherapeutic reagents. Radiation therapy to the head often causes hair loss from the scalp. Not all drugs administered during chemotherapy cause hair loss. However, when hair loss does occur, it most often begins within a few weeks and generally increases up to two months into treatment. Hair usually begins to regrow a few months after treatment ends, with complete regrowth within a year. The color, thickness, and texture of the new hair may be different from the original hair. In summary, we have learned that while skin is the main organ of the integumentary system, other accessory structures and organs complete this system. Hair is a product of one such organ, namely hair follicles. Hair follicles possess many tissue layers and are derived from the epidermis during development. Like skin, surrounding connective tissues support and nourish the hair follicle. Hair goes through repeated cycles of growth and rest phases. Depending on genetics, sex, age, and location on the human body, considerable variation occurs within these growth cycles. Factors including the shape and orientation of hair follicles determine the overall texture of hair. Hair plays numerous functions in humans. Most important are its roles in protection. Hair color, as skin color, is primarily determined by pigments. Variations in the amounts and types of melanin produced by melanocytes determines an individual's hair color. Other factors such as genetic mutations and environmental factors can also influence hair color. Finally, genetics, sex, age, psychological stress, and exposure to chemicals such as those in chemotherapeutic agents can result in hair loss. Join us next time in Module 5.7 as we examine another important accessory structure of the integumentary system, namely nails.